So care of the post-arrest patient, this is quite honestly one of my favorite topics to talk about, something I'm extremely passionate about. As, as Haney said, ROSC is just the beginning. It's just the beginning of a critical series of steps over the ensuing hours so that we can maximize the potential of that patient getting out of the hospital with meaningful neurologic survival. You know the stats well. Each year across the U.S., over 600,000 patients sustain sudden cardiac arrest. Often they are brought to us in our emergency department for resuscitation. And despite all of the things that we do after ROSC, still the stats would say roughly 8 to 9% of patients are discharged from the hospital. That's not necessarily discharged with meaningful neurologic survival, but discharged from the hospital following sudden out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Now, in terms of talking about post-arrest care, there's lots to talk about. And in a short time, we're only going to touch on a few things. Our goals simply in the post-ROSC period, when they're with us in the ED in the early hours and days in the ICU, we really want to optimize neurologic resuscitation and prevent worsening or prevent any type of secondary injury because we know that anoxic brain injury is the most common cause of death in the days to come once patients are admitted to the intensive care unit. Now, many of you know that every few years, the ILCOR and then the AHA update their cardiac arrest and subsequent post-arrest guidelines for the care of these patients. Well, we're still waiting for next year's update every five years. But what I would say is an important paper was published in this year, 2024. This is a scientific statement from the AHA taking a look overall and making some comments and recommendations of where the evidence stands with respect to the care of the post-arrest patient. Now, in that setting, they gathered not only emergency medicine, but critical care cardiology, neurology, pharmacy, nursing to put together these statements, and I'll reference them to bring us most up-to-date with current recommendations on select aspects of caring for the post-arrest patient. Now, one of the big things that they talk about is, and I believe firmly, a protocolized approach to caring for the patient who is who has achieved ROSC from out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Now, the document is quite lengthy and goes into multiple aspects of neurologic management, pulmonary management, cardiovascular or circulatory management, infectious disease, whether we give empiric antibiotics, endocrine, fluid management, a whole host of things that I would strongly encourage you to take a look at that when time permits. When we achieve ROSC and now we're caring for that post-arrest patient, I think there are a few critical aspects of this critically ill patient to pay attention to, and that's the right oxygenation and ventilation post-arrest. With respect to oxygenation, I think we know that hypoxia in the post-arrest setting will aggravate neurologic injury and thus result in poor outcomes. We also know, and you've heard me say in recent years, that we're looking at the extreme of oxygenation or hyperoxia also as linked to potential poor outcomes in the post-arrest patient. The most recent study taking a look at oxygenation in the post-arrest patient was the BOX trial. And I think all of you are very familiar with this with respect to looking at optimal MAP and also optimal oxygenation target. We'll go through this pretty quickly. Recall this was a study out of Denmark taking a look at restrictive versus liberal targets for oxygenation in the post-arrest patient, whereby they enrolled adults who had sustained ROSC from out-of-hospital cardiac arrest from a presumed cardiac etiology, whereby they were randomized to a more restrictive O2 target, so essentially starting with a lower FiO2 targeting a PaO2 of around 70 millimeters of mercury versus a more liberal oxygenation target starting with a higher FiO2 and targeting a PaO2 somewhere around 100, taking a look at overall a composite outcome of death or discharge from the hospital with poor neurologic injury. About 790 patients, and at the end of the day, there wasn't a difference per se with respect to a restrictive or more liberal oxygenation target, but I think one of the drawbacks of the most recent study looking at oxygenation 
really is in those levels. Is a PaO2 around 100 high enough to be considered a liberal O2 target? And when we look at the literature that's occurred over the, been published over the last decade, really the PaO2 values are much higher. We don't know at the moment what is a PaO2 threshold above which increases the, the chance of worse neurologic outcome. But when we talk about oxygenation overall, most recent statements from just this year, clinical guidance would be certainly to avoid hypoxia. But when clinically feasible, it may not be your first thing to do. You may be achieving hemodynamic stability with pressors, inotropes, etc. But when possible, work with your respiratory therapist, or if you don't have one, start to dial down the FiO2 really maintaining saturation somewhere between 92 to 98 percent. Don't leave them indefinitely on an FiO2 of 100 percent once you've intubated and now switched over to mechanically ventilating that post-arrest patient. Speaking of ventilation, what do we want to target with respect to ventilation in the post-arrest patient? We do know in the early hours post-arrest, cerebral autoregulation is disrupted. We also know that the cerebral vasculature in general maintains its vasoreactivity to CO2 concentration, so this is important. We know that when patients are hyperventilated, it blows the PCO2 down, and that hypocapnia induces vasoconstriction, which impairs cerebral perfusion or cerebral blood flow and can aggravate secondary neurologic injury. To that end, over recent years, there's been a lot of thought, well, perhaps if hypocapnia is bad, what about a little bit of hypercapnia that may induce cerebral vasodilatation, augment cerebral blood flow, and maybe that actually improves neurologic outcome. This has been looked at now in the TAME study published about a year ago. This was a multi-center study across many countries. As you can see, over 60 ICUs looking at this concept of targeted hypercapnia compared to normocapnia in the post-arrest patient. So very similar to the box trial, adult patients sustain ROSC of a presumed cardiac cause, and they were randomized to targeted hypercapnia, whereby the PCO2 is around 50 to 55, versus normocapnia, where the PCO2 was around 35 to 45. They overall followed it using end tidal CO2 or ABG if end tidal CO2 wasn't available, and they looked at was there a difference overall in favorable neurologic outcome. Secondary outcomes a little bit longer or six-month mortality, and you can see here 1,700 patients included in the TAME trial, and there was no difference in that favorable neurologic outcome with respect to the primary outcome. No difference in overall six-month mortality. No difference in poor functional outcomes by targeting mild hypercapnia in these patients. So where do we stand necessarily? We just hit oxygenation. What about ventilation? Well, by far and away, we should utilize lung protective ventilation strategies in the post-arrest patient. I will submit to you there is very little literature specifically looking at ventil ventilatory settings in the post-arrest patient but as you can see here, roughly 70% of patients post-arrest do end up developing some type of ARDS, which is why existing and now most recent guidelines and statements recommend utilizing those lung protective ventilatory settings that you're all very used to. I hate to break in here, but if you are enjoying this lecture right now, then you wanna check out the entire Recess X reunion filmed live in Philadelphia 2024. There are over 60 talks that you can watch on replay for life. Right now we have a coupon that gets you 20% off that entire package. Again, 20% off to watch the entire conference for life. So if you're enjoying this video and you wanna watch lots more, go to the link below and sign up. Now back to the video. With respect to other aspects of ventilation, leaning on the TAME study, really also targeting normocapnia. So adjusting your tidal volume, adjusting your respiratory rate to target, could be an end tidal CO2, but if you're following PACO2s in that normal range of about 35 to 45. The most recent statement from this year does give you a little bit of leeway 
and someone who may come in with just existing higher levels of PCO2. And you can all think who those patients may be. And if you have existing data to suggest that they may run at a higher PCO2, having them be at a hypercapnic state, provided that you're following the pH, may be reasonable for that small select patient population. But in general, lung protective settings and target normocapnia by adjusting your ventilatory parameters. I'll be honest, another aspect of my care in the post-arrest patient that I've become much more aware of in recent years is this aspect. So this would be probably the most important thing I would convey to you in the post-arrest patient is to think about seizures. They occur in roughly a third of post-arrest patients. This is something I really didn't appreciate for many years, and they can occur in those first 24 hours and take many forms. We'd recognize the generalized myoclonic or tonic-clonic activity. These can be focal, may just be a little bit of twitching, may be a little bit of rhythmic movement, movement of the fingers, may just have myoclonic activity, or in many cases, may be actually clinically silent. Our sedatives, and if you are using for any reason a neuromuscular blocking agent in that post-arrest period, may also mask ongoing seizure activity. And because of the prevalence, even the most recent statement would recommend EEG monitoring as soon as feasible. We do not have a time frame as to which we should enact EEG monitoring. Importantly, in the comatose patient or someone who remains unresponsive, after return of spontaneous circulation. Once EEG monitoring is obtained and it does show seizure activity, we're gonna use the same medications. There's nothing different about the post-arrest patient. So typically initiating benzodiazepine therapy could be followed by levetiracetam, phenytoin. They do recommend also valproic acid. I'll be honest, that's not my first go-to from an anti-epileptic drug or anti-seizure medication, but nonetheless, you're going to follow your established protocols or medication algorithm at your respective institutions. Now, one would ask if we can't get EEG, I don't have the resources, and if there is such a high prevalence, can I just empirically and prophylactically give an anti-epileptic medication to every post-arrest patient? That's been looked at, not in a robust amount of literature, but it has been looked at and it doesn't lead to better outcomes, so it currently is not recommended. And I'll be honest, in this most recent statement, what they do recommend from this huge panel of folks that scoured over the literature is that if you can't get EEG monitoring, consider transfer to a facility for EEG monitoring. Now that, I'm not sure that that's going to be feasible on every single post-arrest patient you're going to then transfer out. But nonetheless, it is a consideration in the most recent statement from the AHA. And lastly, here in the remaining minute, I have to touch on pan-CT after arrest. And many of you are familiar with the CT-FIRST study out of two U.S. hospitals looking at the benefit of a pan-CT post-arrest in adult patients with out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, whereby the cause was unknown of their arrest. In essence, they compared to historical controls, typical process whereby they got a post-arrest EKG looking for STEMI, a post-arrest POCUS looking for myocardial dysfunction, and then a CT of the head compared to their sudden death protocol looking at adding an EKG-gated CT of the chest followed by a venous phase runoff of the abdomen and pelvis and looking to see if that increased the yield for what caused that patient's arrest and did it affect the diagnosis of time-dependent critical conditions? Many of you are familiar with the results, roughly 250 patients. And yes, that pan-CT post-arrest did increase the yield for identifying what caused that patient's arrest. And you can see a marked difference in, in the time to detect critical conditions that or complications that may have arisen as a result of the resuscitation. So I think when feasible, I certainly am attempting to get, when I'm transferring that post-arrest patient, if they're going to cath lab, they're going to cath lab for a STEMI. But if they're heading to the ICU, if feasible, I certainly will go through CT and do a pan-CT because while it didn't change mortality in this particular study, 
I think we would really want to know about sitting on time dependent things that may actually change the things that are done for that patient in the ICU. So with respect to post arrest care, just a few pearls before ending here. From an oxygenation standpoint, when feasible, dial down that FiO2. Just need to keep saturations between 92 to 98%. Don't need to sustain them at 100%. Continue to use your lung protective ventilatory strategies, but adjust ventilatory parameters to target normocapnia. Really think about seizures and that, and that, that patient remains comatose, certainly during an extended ED stay or in the first 24 hours per se of an ICU admission, there is a high incidence of seizure activity in that patient. Really consider EEG monitoring and if detected, follow your same treatment algorithm with respect that of treating seizures that you would if it were a non-arrest patient. And then think about the post-arrest pan-CT to help your ICU colleagues not only diagnose what may have caused that arrest, but also complications that may have arisen as a result of resuscitative efforts. And with that, Haney, I'm going to draw to a close. Thanks so much for your attention.